audience and friends to Cancer Convos with Grace B. This is your host, Grace B, coming to you from New York City, the city that never sleeps and is home to Cancer Convos with Grace B. I'd like to thank you all for your amazing support on all my platforms. For the newbies, this show aims to demystify the cancer disease and to give and to bring experts and stakeholders um, in the cancer space uh, to come give their take. So, um, as I always harp at the beginning of the show, don't forget to go for your medical checks because until there's a cure, prevention is the cure. So with me in this episode today, um, which is titled Patient Inclusion in MedTech, is the VP Head MedTech at Branding Science. You're going to be hearing much more about him because I don't want to demystify him just yet. Um, he'll be answering a lot of the questions that I'll be asking and um, expatiating on certain things. So um, without much ado, let me welcome Tom Donnelly to the show. Welcome, Tom, and I'm so happy to see you today. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Grace. I really appreciate you having me on here. Thank you. So um, our audience, they're all waiting to hear um, about you. So could you please uh, give us a brief bio of yourself? Sure, I'm glad to. Uh, so to kind of tell you about my uh, past experience, I went to NYU, speaking of New York. I uh, got a PhD in cognitive psychology there. I went on to be a visiting assistant professor at Rutgers for a few years, teaching psychology and statistics, experimental methods. Uh, and then I moved into the healthcare insights industry in 2005. Most of my work has been in uh, the medical device and technology sector. So I would say med tech. Um, branding science, where I work now, is an insights led consultancy serving the healthcare sector. So I'm a VP at branding science, where I lead the med tech group. Uh, I'm involved in a lot of other things that we'll probably talk about as we go through uh, the episode. Um, I also lead their inclusion team, for example. I'm involved in different uh, industry organizations. Uh, so I lead the health literacy team at Intellis Worldwide, which is a nonprofit that serves the healthcare insights industry. I'm also a founding member of the Digital Healthcare Collaborative, a group that brings together knowledge leaders from pharmaceutical med tech solution providers, health insurance, and hospital groups to serve digital health problems in the industry. And in fact, I'm coming to you today from Fort Worth, Texas, where we're uh, doing one of our meetings of the digital health care group. Well, thank you so much. You're in Texas. So I'm, I'm so happy you were able to carve out time to be with us today. <laughs> thank you so much. So um, could you now tell us, please, what is the mission of Branding Science? Sure. And so let me tell you, uh, so branding science is at the core, we're trying to help build better futures for our clients, their patients, and our community. And there are a few elements incorporated into that, uh, including self-belief, passion, courage, growth, smarts, and respect differences. But the real key is that patients are at the heart of our noble purpose. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I do at Branding Science uh, in my position is I train staff internally on med tech insights work. Uh, I communicate externally by presenting and publishing. And then I work with clients to answer their business and research questions through custom primary market research. Oh, wow. You have quite a lot under your purview, don't you? <laughs> but that's True. good. That's, that's very nice. So health um, literacy is something I'm very passionate about. And um, I was pleasantly surprised that you also are very well involved in, in this very important facet of uh, healthcare. So, um, you know, tell me how your organization is going about, uh, you know, um, empowering people with um, uh, health literacy, especially the patient. What is it that you're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, I've been a member of Intellis Worldwide for many years. Uh, I joined their health literacy group. Uh, I found it interesting as they were starting off. I wanted to help them with their primary research that they were doing. And then along the journey that we've been on, uh, trying to help people understand what health literacy is and why it's important, uh, they asked me to actually lead the group. So I'm running their group now. Um, and it's really, it's a group, uh, a coalition of volunteers 
across 14 uh, different companies. And it's really dedicated to harnessing the power of health literacy in marketing research to improve patient outcomes uh, in the healthcare market research industry. Now, we recently changed our name you know, because we're trying to you know, do exactly what we're preaching. And so people don't tend to know what health literacy is unless you're in the industry. So we've changed it to Clear Healthcare Communications Task Force because that's what we're after is clear healthcare communications. Um, oh, wow, so, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I could tell you more about it if you're interested. Uh, but our goal is to provide the leaders in the healthcare insights industry with the tools, the understanding uh, that's required to address the growing needs of patients uh, with a variety of health literacy levels. Uh, so we're trying to raise awareness, number one, and understanding of the issues that's related uh, to these things, as well as to um, make sure that healthcare practitioners, uh, healthcare professionals, patients, and caregivers are all involved. And so we do trainings, we do primary research and publications and presentations. Wow, that's awesome. You know, so um, could you tell us a bit, for those that don't know, what, um, what does Entelus actually represent? Aside, sure. is it just the patient voice or do they do other things as well? No, and it's probably confusing because I wear multiple hats. Uh -huh. um, but so, so uh, Intellis Worldwide, it's a nonprofit. It serves the healthcare insights or marketing research industry. Uh, there's typically two conferences. There's a bigger spring conference and then there's a smaller fall conference. Uh, there's also a lot of things virtual, especially these days. So, you know, there are webinars, there's a lot of uh, tools online through their portal. But what it is, is to connect the people like myself that are involved in this industry, you know, to network and to share information. So, and there's really three different stakeholders. So there's end clients from pharmaceutical and um, med tech companies that are trying to, you know, perform and get information for their companies. There are vendors like myself that gather that data and report that data to them. And then there are suppliers that help us, you know, interact and get the uh, respondents that we need to understand what's happening in the marketplace. So all of those players come together in this space, often in person pre-pandemic, but more virtually and hybrid post-pandemic uh, to really network, understand what's the latest uh, what are people up to? How could we be doing our work better? Awesome. That's that's great. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, um, what usually um, interests me is trying to see how communities can be armed with, um, you know, uh, education, information, um, raise uh, a certain amount of uh, level of awareness, you know, about mm. medtech you know, because now we have the aging population that doesn't really know much about it. It's usually the millennials now and the Gen Zs that are telling their, you know, parents and grandparents about med tech. So how can we ensure, or how do you think you can ensure that, um, you know, med tech is accessible and, uh, and available at their, finger uh, mm -hmm. at their fingertips? Yeah, it's definitely a tricky but important question. Um, you know, first of all, you know, with my health literacy hat on, you need to provide information in a way which is, you know, easily understandable to all people. Um, you know, some people may want that detailed scientific explanation, but it's better if we can provide a simple message that everyone can understand to make, the, you know, the information accessible. Um, but in terms of accessibility, you know, it comes down partly to just having better infrastructure you know, so that everyone has access to the tools, to the high-speed internet that you need uh, to be able to use med tech, especially in the home. Um, so it would be great if we could have affordable, basic level uh, healthcare med tech and treatment for all. Um, and I think that's some things that, you know, people have been trying to work on lately. But you also have to balance that off with those uh, people that need the incentive the entrepreneurs to come up with these great ideas, you know, so that they can obviously profit from them. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. But in terms of accessibility, you know, one thought I had uh, as we're talking is if you're in a place where you don't have, you know, at home, the things that you need, you might be able to go into say a pharmacy, you know, places like CVS and Walmart, they're able to provide this virtual uh, digital space where people 
could connect with their physicians virtually if they need to. Um, and if you're interested in that topic, I can point you to a couple uh, podcast episodes I did with two of the members of the Digital Healthcare Collaborative uh, from October, Mike Mache and um, Jan Oldenburg. So if you're interested in that, please check those out. Oh, definitely. I'll, I'll be, um, you know, asking you for the links very soon, you know, so that other people can um, access them as well. Um, so, uh, you know, um, the explosion of uh, med tech, especially du during the pandemic, this pandemic period has been something else. So what are your lessons and takeaways from the pandemic from, from your per per perspective, please? Yeah, it's really interesting because you know, so many bad things have happened. So many people have had issues, obviously, through the pandemic. Um, some good things have come out of it, though. So there was a lot of things brewing in med tech before the pandemic. And because of it, it really accelerated its development and use. So, for example, I see a big shift in care at the home. Uh, it can really be tailored to the individual and can fit into their lifestyle uh, and can actually reduce the cost of the entire healthcare system. Uh, so that's some of the good things I have seen, you know, happening is that acceleration. Uh, of course, it's going to take time and money to get it right. But I think in the long term, if we can have care at home, I think everyone will really benefit. Absolutely. Um, everybody's at home now. And these are, this is a situation in which we all find ourselves. So mm. Um, for those that can't really move about, yeah, that would be so, um, you know, interesting and uh, wonderful for them. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, with what I do, as you know, being a cancer, you know, patient and survivor, uh, you know, been harnessing that crazy experience and, um, you know, using it to further the um, patient voice agenda, so to speak. It's very close to my heart. So um, please, could you expatiate a bit on, on your company's goals regarding the patient voice? Oh, sure. Yeah, I appreciate you asking me that. And in fact, I'm glad that you're going to be one of our uh, spokespeople, one of our uh, people that we'll talk Yay! to. Um, thank so you. thank you for doing that. Uh, but to, for those who don't know what I'm talking about, um, the patient point of view uh, is something that branding science has done to really live our noble purpose. Because at the heart of what we do is helping our clients help their patients have better lives. Uh, so to, we always keep the patient at the forefront of our work when we're you know, doing our day-to-day -day work. But because you know how it goes, you get so ingrained and entrenched in what you're doing day-to-day, -day, working on the nuts and bolts of things, sometimes you lose you know, that mission. And so to keep that alive, we've decided to have an internal series of events. So this has nothing to do with, you know, outside people with clients or anything. It's only for the people in the company. Uh, we call it the patient point of view. We ask people like yourself to come in with varying journeys and uh, varying backgrounds to really tell us about, you know, their experience and what kind of journey they've been on. And these engagements are not only informative, you know, for us about different disease states, about different patient experiences, it also becomes very emotionally moving and it really connects us back to the core mission of what we're doing in our noble purpose. That's, that's awesome. I'm so, I'm so happy that uh, this is actually one of your, you know, core um, strengths in the organization because, you know, actually without the patient voice, then who are you working for? without med tech or without the patient, mm -hmm, what would med tech mm -hmm. be, you know, doing? That's you true. Know, so it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. So, um, you know, you were talking about earlier, um, if people cannot access med tech, they go to, you know, they could go to their pharmacies or whatever. Um, of, of course, we know also this pertains to one of the social determinants of health, which is the digital mm -hmm. divide. So, um, that, um, an aging population, um, and lack of health literacy in underserved communities, you know, how are you building diversity and inclusion, especially regarding, um, you know, these social determinants that so blatantly exist, the, the, the gaps? Mm. It's a very difficult question, a very important issue. Uh, and I think, 
it's it's beyond one person. It's beyond one company. Everyone needs to really come together and find ways to to bridge that gap. Uh, I know that I'm trying to help in a few different ways. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned at Branding Science, uh, I help lead their inclusion team. And our mission is to promote and celebrate inclusion, creating a sense of belonging in the workplace and beyond. I won't go into depth all about it, but it's really about our company and our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, so that our staff feel you know, good about themselves. They show up as themselves so they can do you know, great and uh, meaningful work. Um, but then, at, as I mentioned uh, at Intellis Worldwide, in addition to working on the health literacy uh, group that I lead, I'm also part of, they have a DEI think tank that's working uh, with end clients, uh, pharmaceutical med tech companies, uh, as well as insights, people like myself and sample suppliers that help us with the respondents. And across all of those stakeholders, we're trying to make the industry a more inclusive space. Um, and it's, it's going to take time, but we're, we've started with a white paper where we're going to say, here is what the issue is as we understand it, and here's a direction we think the industry should go in. So, for example, when I get an end client sends me a request for proposal and they're looking in a specific you know, type of you know, disease state or a type of physician they want to talk to, then I go to my sample suppliers and say, hey, I'm looking for this type of person to talk to. Uh, they, you know, typically standard panels have um, certain people they reach out to, but those panels are not always completely inclusive. Uh, you may not get people from rural areas, for example. Uh, you may not have great representation uh, of, you know, of certain minority groups. And so we need to do a better job in making sure that the work that we're doing includes all voices so that we can really make sure that the kind of things we're doing are um, accessible and inclusive. Uh, because sometimes if, you're, if you make a key that only fits one lock, well, then you can only open that door and you really need to be thinking more broadly. Uh, so for example, with a med tech tool, if you're designing some new device, first you want to go out and see what is the unmet need. You know, you want to you do some ethnographic type work or contextual inquiry to see, you know, what's happening in the environment. You know, where is the need that isn't being met? You then design something uh, to try to fill that gap. But as you're designing it, you really need to let the end users try it out, you know, to handle it, to use it to see you know, what doesn't make sense to them or you know, where things need to be redesigned or tweaked. Uh, and it's through that continual evolution of redesign and retest that you can get something that people can benefit from. But if the people that you are working with in that process uh, are only one narrow group, then you're not really gonna meet the needs of everyone. Um, and then not only is it limiting for the company that's making it, but it's limited for the potential users User. that could be using it. Yeah, absolutely. You beat me to that because um, I was just about to ask you something. I was just about to ask um, what advice you would give to that startup that is wishing to launch, you know, um, in the med tech space and, you know, uh, telepathy, you, you, you came out ahead of time. Yes, <laughs> it means that they have to actually know what their niche is all about, their end users, and um, make sure that um, everybody is carried along. Yeah. I think in, in addition to that, so not only do you have to know what, what the need is out there and making sure you tailor it uh, to, you know, people so that they can, you know, use it, obviously. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you know who you're serving you know, who are you for? What problem are you solving? Are you doing it better than others? You know, and if so, then what is your purpose? You know, so that you could be a purpose-driven company. Uh, in addition, you want to make sure that it's profitable, obviously. But if you find a need in the market and you can solve that problem, then you will be able to get it paid for. But when the different stakeholders look at something in terms of whether it's going to be approved and used, you know, by payers, for example, in the healthcare system, you also want to make sure it reduces the cost of the overall healthcare system, uh, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Um, because, for example, I, I wouldn't have to go and see my doctor if I could actually, you know, have a face-to-face -face, uh, 
um, you know, interaction with him, you know, without mm. me using. So that really cuts down on transportation costs, cuts down on mm. a, a lot of things, you know, and um, probably co-pay wouldn't be as as high mm. as, um, mm -hmm. you know, if one went in person. So, yes, it does make a lot of sense. Thank and you in so that regard, that. you know, the, there are these terms that, again, some of the episodes I could point you to, you know, we talk about um, a digital front door, for example. So normally, you know, you know, years ago before we were doing so much virtual, if you were going to your doctor's appointment, you might get a reminder on your phone or your mm -hmm. email, right? Uh, but then you show up, you have to sign in, you know, give me your latest insurance card, pay your copay, yeah. uh, and so forth. And then you go in and you see your physician. Uh, they may ask you, you know, go through your history, anything that's been different. Did you get any blood work, you know, do your physical exam, et cetera. Um, in the past, everything was on paper charts, right? And you could hear them, you're sitting in your, you know, in your paper robe, uh, sitting there, you know, cold, <laughs> and you you hear them outside the door. They're picking up their folder, and and for two minutes, they're flipping through your folder. Yeah. And then they come in the room, right? So the idea with uh, with, with digital first uh, is one thing that we can talk about, or a virtual front door, is that if you have all the data that's surrounding you, and imagine it's the individual that is coming with all of this context. And if the physician, you know, and the healthcare team knows, okay, so Tom is now coming in and is checking in, like, I don't need to go through all of that paperwork because you know who I am. You have my information. I'm all connected. You may even have a connection to say, oh yeah, Tom is here. He's coming in. His appointment is here. Instead of the doctor having to leaf through the paper uh, chart, he has it all digitally. He may have spent some time a few minutes before I, I've arrived or the day before thinking about what things he wants to talk to me about. He may already have all the lab stuff. Uh, they may tell you a week or two in advance, don't forget to go get your blood drawn so that we can talk about X, Y, Z. Um, so it's really the integration across physical and virtual, no matter where you are. And that is really the tricky part because as the system was being designed, we didn't design it to connect easily with others. Mm -hmm. And so, so groups did their own thing. And then if you go to different specialists, it may be hard to connect and get that yeah. information to and fro. Yeah. Um, but I think we've been making really good uh, strides these days in making mm -hmm. things more interconnected and more easily accessible. Um, and so that's really important when you think about, as you say, you know, you need to have a discussion with your physician it doesn't have to be necessarily in person, you know, Hey, I have this issue. I want to talk to you about, you know, can you just hop on a quick call? And it yeah. could even be some other version of a message. You know, maybe it's not even video, maybe it's a text or maybe it's an email or something. So I think that allows people to have better access for where they are to get better care in a more timely and more cost-effective manner. Absolutely. I, I love that. Um, digital front door thing and um, having to, um, how about, you know, because like most of us that are patients, we're not just dealing with one, one doctor or one, you know, specialist. So we're, there's a multidisciplinary team that we have to constantly, you know, um, uh, reaching out to or them mm -hmm. reaching out to us and, and all that. How do you think, um, all these or the partners, let's say, our partners, mm -hmm. the healthcare, can come, you know, be kind of assimilated into that virtual door at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult problem to solve. I think we are getting closer to it day by day. Right. I, I admit I'm not an expert in this space, but from what I'm told, there are certain laws that are coming into effect that have been in the works for a long time that make it so that you and I can easily say to anyone, I want my data and that I have now access to that data. Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to make it so that the pieces of the puzzle fit together better so that you can more easily you know, integrate things from one provider to another. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we're fully there yet, but there are people working to get us to that place because yeah. it's really one of the, the key problems is if you, you know, 
I know that my family, you know, when they go from doctor to doctor, they bring them things physically from another specialist, which just seems bizarre to me that they cannot just simply have access to those records. So, it, it, I mean, we're in an era where things are now starting to happen. It's, you know, it's coming out of this level of frustration where things weren't easily um, integrated, but yeah. I think we're getting there soon. And it's, it's a big issue because if you don't have access to the right information, you could do the wrong thing, Absolutely. you know, misprescribe or mistreat because you didn't realize that another specialist was doing something. Absolutely. I, I, fantastic. That's uh, I fully agree with that. Absolutely. And like you said, the new laws that we now have the, you know, HIPPA, you know, um, that is trying to make sure that our data, you know, um, belongs to us. And mm -hmm. then we have to give, um, acknowledgement and the go ahead for people to access it. Mm -hmm. I think with time, we're getting there, as you said, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we're, we're getting there. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Tom. So um, um, if there was one thing that, you know, you could say um, in the next how many years you to improve the healthcare industry in the, here in the United States, mm -hmm. what would it be and why? That's a tough one, um, but <laughs> and I... I think you alluded to it early uh, in, in our discussion, and that is, you know, focus on preventative care and, and also predictive med tech, mm -hmm. um, you know, so we can be as healthy, all of us as we can be, you know, at the famous quote by Ben Franklin, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I think he was really talking about the fire department, but uh, in this case, <laughs> I think that's really true, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Um, and that's some of the things that the group that I'm working with, um, the Digital Healthcare Collaborative, is working on. Uh, if people are mindful of what it is they need to do, that may not be enough to motivate you. And so how do you get people to you know, change their habits, you know, to, to do the things that they know they need to do so that they exactly. don't need as much treatment and care down the road? Uh, I really think that's the key. Plus, if you have med tech that can be very predictive, for example, you've heard of, um, you know, children that were wearing Apple watches that alerted them that they had a certain uh, heart defect, mm -hmm. like because of that alert, they ended up, you know, uh, getting this advanced warning and being able to get treated where they needed. Absolutely. Um, so this has been such a great conversation. Honestly, I wish we could go on and on, but I know you have to get back to your meetings and all that. So all work and no play makes Tom a dumb, uh, adult boy. Uh, so what's one fun word that is used to describe you, Tom? <laughs> hmm. Uh, well, it's, it's funny, as you see now, the sun is coming out here oh, in Fort wow, Worth. Oh, I can see you glowing now. <laughs> the sun is on your face. <laughs> Which is a good thing. Um, I think the, the one thing that I people always know I talk about is that I'm a dog lover. Uh, oh, I like have, me? Uh, so yeah. am I. I love dogs. Oh, boy. I, I have a, a golden doodle uh, named Jack, and we actually okay. trained him to be uh, a therapy dog. And uh, he's got the best personality for it. And so... You know, whenever I'm not working, I'm probably hanging out with him and bringing him to different places where he could make other people feel good. So that's one of the things I like to do in my spare time. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I love dogs, honestly. And, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm on Instagram and Instagram, I think it's the algo that knows that Grace is always looking at dogs. So I just <laughs> pictures and videos of dogs flood my time, my, my, mm -hmm. my timeline. So, oh, yes, that's that's beautiful. So before we go, um, could you share your social media handles, please? Sure. I mean, the biggest thing that I'm on is LinkedIn, and you can easily okay. find me, uh, just Tom Donnelly. Uh, it'd be hard to miss me. Uh, I, I once in a while go on Twitter, but I don't really do much on Twitter, to be honest with you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anyway, those will be your um, links, to your social media, or, you know, LinkedIn will be in the show notes. So anybody that is watching now and would like to reach out to you and everything, and you'll have to send me those links for the podcast. Oh, yes. I, I, I love that digital, you know, door, digital mm -hmm. virtual door. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in that and I'd love to listen to it. Oh, great. Anybody who's interested could go to... Uh, 
medtechchat.com online and you can find the podcast there medtechchat.com okay and then also i'm on spotify so you can find me there as well oh great i'm on spotify as well so i'll i'll do that so dear tom thank you so much for coming and working with me in exploring this uh intersection of the patient and uh, DEI and you know medtech itself and I'm looking forward to being on your show huh? it's a promise right oh yes well I look forward to you coming to do our patient point of view which is our internal uh discussion to, to okay. hear about your journey but perhaps we could also have you on my podcast uh, medtech chat okay. and talk about uh things there all right then Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really grateful for, for your, you know, taking time to, to come out, even during your hectic uh, schedules and all that. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, it works out perfectly. So before I let you go, let me talk to my audience. So um, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. I've been talking to the amazing Tom Donnelly about his passion uh, regarding med tech and what he does at branding science um, you'll be hearing more about him in the show notes um, i'll put his links and everything there so don't forget if you do like our channel please um, like subscribe and share because knowledge is power so thank you so much guys until the next episode this is grace b ciao ciao thank you tom thank you